So we're going to continue our look at positive reinforcements in this video, and we are going to take a look at the nine, yes, nine uh, guidelines for using positive reinforcement. And I know what you're thinking, nine, that's way too much. There couldn't possibly be that many. Well, we're going to find out because I'm Dr. Igor Yudichevich, and this is Functional Analysis of Behavior 1. Let's go. All right, so we got nine, count them, nine guidelines for applying reinforcement effectively. So let's get going. We're going to start with number one. All right, so number one guideline, the first guideline, is when you're choosing a criterion for reinforcement, that is, how good does a behavior need to be before it's reinforced? What level of behavior needs to be reached before it's reinforced? Guideline number one says you want to set an easily achieved initial criterion for reinforcement. And this one actually comes with a very practical guide on how to choose that initial criterion. You're going to notice that not all of them do, but this one comes with a very practical guide from Heward in 1980. And he mentioned that if you want to increase behavior, you take a look at your baseline. You take a look at the baseline for the behavior you want to increase and the criterion for reinforcement, the level of behavior that this person needs to reach to receive reinforcement is higher than the average during the baseline, but lower than the maximum or best level during baseline. So it's somewhere in between the average and the best that they did during baseline. That's to increase behavior. If on the other hand, you wanna decrease behavior, if we're dealing with uh, harmful behaviors that we want to decrease, you take a look at the average and you take a look at the lowest level of the behavior and you choose a criterion somewhere in between those two endpoints. And that's gonna guarantee that it's gonna be slightly challenging for your individual, for your participant, but it's gonna be very attainable, which means that you're gonna be able to reinforce this individual, which means that the behavior modification can get going. Guideline number two. All right, guideline number two is a little bit more frustrating than guideline number one because there is not an exact sort of um, formula for how to determine this, but basically you wanna use high quality reinforcers of sufficient magnitude. So after you've done your establishing operations, after you've made your reinforcers basically reinforcing, you wanna make sure that your reinforcers basically match up to the difficulty of the behavior that you are trying to reinforce. So if it's a very difficult behavior, make sure that you use a high quality reinforcer, but if it's a less difficult behavior, you can pull back on the quality of that reinforcer Basically, you want them to be motivated, but you don't want to give it all away. And uh, that is guideline number two. Make sure that you're using those high quality reinforcers, but also make sure that they're of sufficient magnitude that it's tied into how difficult the behavior is and how difficult the reinforcers are to earn. Guideline number three. Guideline number three says that you want to use varied reinforcers to maintain potent establishing operations. So again, establishing operations are those operations that we go through, those procedures that we go through to make a reinforcer reinforcing. So we mentioned a very specific establishing operation in the last video, which was the response deprivation hypothesis. But basically, once you had those establishing operations, you wanna use varied reinforcers to maintain that potent established operation. Because if you keep using the same reinforcer over and over and over again, that reinforcer is going to lose its reinforcing power. So think about an edible reinforcer. If you keep, uh, if you're uh, continually giving a person the same edible reinforcer, you've done well, here's a piece of chocolate. 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 Eventually, that chocolate's not gonna be very reinforcing. So we need to use varied reinforcers. And what kind of reinforcers can we use? Well, we can turn to the last video and take a look at the five categories of reinforcers and use any of the ones from those five categories to make sure that our reinforcers are varied. Guideline number four. All right, guideline number four tells us that we should use direct rather than indirect reinforcement contingencies when possible. So what are direct versus indirect reinforcement contingencies? We'll start with indirect reinforcement contingencies. Indirect reinforcement contingencies is when the consequence of a behavior has to be given by an intermediary. That means it has to be given 
by the person who's actually controlling the contingency, by the person who's actually trying to modify the behavior. So when somebody does something well and you give them a piece of chocolate as an edible reinforcer, that is an indirect reinforcement contingency. A direct reinforcement contingency is when the reinforcement occurs as a consequence, a natural consequence of the behavior. So let's say that we were doing something where we were trying to teach someone uh, to open a jar. We could use indirect reinforcement where we give them the jar and as soon as they open it, we say, hey, excellent, here's a piece of chocolate, here's an edible reinforcer. That would be indirect reinforcement contingency. On the other hand, we could do a direct reinforcement contingency by simply placing the chocolate inside the jar. And then as soon as they open the jar, they are directly reinforced by, as a natural consequence of that behavior. So always be on the lookout for how to have direct reinforcement contingencies in place rather than indirect reinforcement contingencies. And often, as we're gonna see in just a little bit, we start off with indirect reinforcement contingencies and then eventually we change it over to direct reinforcement contingencies. But direct ones are preferred and that is guideline number four. Guideline number five. All right, so guideline number five tells us to combine response prompts and reinforcement. And response prompts, these are the discriminative stimuli for reinforcement. This is what happens before a behavior, AKA it prompts the response, it prompts the behavior. And eventually this takes on the, the function of being stimulus control. It eventually is something that will then trigger the behavior in the future. So the three major types of response prompts equal are things like instructions. So telling somebody, if you do this, then you will get this reinforcement. Things like modeling, actually showing the person how the behavior is done. And then the third one is actual physical guidance, actually moving the person's body to help them achieve the behavior. And those types of response prompts should be used in combination with reinforcement to establish that response prompt as a discriminative stimulus for reinforcement, which then allows us to bring that behavior under stimulus control. Effective guideline number six. You need two, two hands for this one, six. All right, effective guideline number six is to initially reinforce each and every occurrence of the behavior. And the important word there is initially. So eventually, we're gonna to want to pull back on how much we're reinforcing a behavior. Eventually, we're gonna to want to go to what is known as intermittent reinforcement, which is where not every occurrence of the behavior is reinforced. However, when we begin behavior modification, when we start the contingency, it is most effective to reinforce each and every occurrence of that behavior. So basically, you wanna do it like when you're voting uh, for the president. You wanna vote early, you wanna vote often. Just kidding, but in reinforcement contingencies, you wanna reinforce early, you wanna reinforce often, AKA you wanna reinforce every single time. All right, guideline number seven, lucky number seven. Lucky guideline number seven is to provide contingent attention and descriptive praise when you provide positive reinforcement. So this is just, this is going back to that idea of the social reinforcers that category of reinforces that you always have. You always have social reinforces that you can give. So one guideline, guideline number seven, says that when you're reinforcing, provide contingent attention and provide descriptive praise. So what is contingent attention? Contingent attention is attention that is contingent on the successful completion of a, of a behavior. So it's a consequence of the behavior. It's one of the positive reinforcers. They do a, a reinforcer and you give them attention. That's a social reinforcer as we saw in the last video. But what about descriptive praise? Well, descriptive praise, you want to do two forms of descriptive praise. You wanna use general praise, which is a general sort of good job, at a boy, at a girl, way to go. And then you wanna combine that with a brief description, hence descriptive, brief description of the approved behavior. So I like the way you put your clothes away. Uh, I like the way you wrote that uh, word. Uh, I like the way you paid attention during the entire class. So you combine general praise with a brief description of what exactly solicited the general praise. What was that approved behavior that got praise? 
All right, all right, we're on guideline number eight. We can make it, here we go. Guideline number eight. All right, so guideline number eight is to gradually increase the response to reinforcement delay. And the response to reinforcement delay is exactly what it sounds like. It is the time between when the response occurs and when the reinforcement is presented. And initially, you want a very quick response to reinforcement delay. In fact, reinforcers are most effective when there's almost zero response to reinforcement delay. Basically, the closer you can get that reinforcement to the behavior, the more effective that reinforcement is going to be. However, that does not occur in everyday life contingencies. In fact, a lot of our frustrations come from the fact that there is a large response to reinforcement delay for a lot of the behaviors that we consider adulting. A lot of those hard adult behaviors are difficult because of that large response to reinforcement delay. All right, think about the last time that you had to study for an exam that was two weeks away. It's hard to do that when it's that delayed to the point where you're gonna get reinforced. However, this is important and it's an effective means of positive reinforcement because it mimics your everyday life contingencies. This person that you're treating, this person that you're gonna to try to help out, they're not always gonna be under your care, they're not always gonna be in a situation where you control the contingencies. So we wanna set up these situations that mimic everyday life contingencies so gradually increasing those response to reinforcement delays is a effective way to apply that positive reinforcement. All right, here we are. Guideline number nine. All right, guideline number nine indicates that we should gradually shift from contrived to naturally occurring reinforcers. You want to move the reinforcers from reinforcers that you provide to reinforcers that naturally occur as a result of the behavior. And this goes back to that idea of indirect versus direct contingencies. This is a form of indirect versus direct contingencies, but now we're moving the reinforcement to something that naturally occurs uh, from the behavior rather than a direct reinforcement that we had to set up. So what we mean by this is initially you're going to have contrived reinforcers, contrived positive reinforcers. Hey, you did really well. Here's a chocolate. Hey, you did really well. Here's an attaboy plus I really like the way that you, you know, spell check that essay, whatever the behavior is. But eventually, at the idea of satisfaction and a job well done. So every single time that you did something and you stepped back from it and you said, wow, that was good. That was a good thing that I did. That is a naturally occurring reinforcer. So things like uh, in sports, when you hit a ball and you hit a home run, that is a naturally occurring reinforcer. Seeing it go over that fence, naturally occurring reinforcer. Um, when you do well on a test and you get that A+, naturally occurring reinforcer. Um, when you paint a picture and you step back and you say, whoa, that's a great picture, naturally occurring reinforcer. And the effective use of reinforcement tells us to got a gradually shift away from those contrived reinforcers here's a chocolate for a good job to the naturally occurring reinforcers where the person gets satisfaction from the job well done or satisfaction from things that occur because of their behavior all right so those were the nine yes there were nine uh, guidelines for effective use of positive reinforcement we talked about guideline number one easily achieved initial criterion guideline number two high quality reinforcers, guideline uh, number three, using varied reinforcers, guideline number four, uh, going from uh, indirect to direct uh, reinforcement contingencies wherever possible. We actually need two end pages for this. Uh, guideline uh, number five, using those response prompts. Uh, guideline number six, reinforcing every single occurrence of a behavior. Guideline uh, number seven, providing contingent attention, attention and descriptive praise. Guideline number eight, uh, guideline number eight. <laughs> guideline number eight, gradually increasing the response to reinforcement delay. And that delay right there, completely planned, uh-huh, 100%. And then finally, uh, guideline number nine, shifting from uh, contrived uh, reinforcers that you provide to naturally occurring reinforcers that are a consequence of the behavior. All right, so that was a lot to cover. Uh, thank you for sticking me, with me the whole way. Next time, we're going to take a look at the uh, principle of negative reinforcement, which is the one that 
most of our uh, world gets wrong all the time but it is reinforcement and we're going to take a look at some of the special things to consider for negative reinforcement uh but until then thank you for joining me and uh, stay frosty stay functional All right, so we got nine, count them, nine uh, guidelines. <laughs> All right, so we got nine, count them, nine guidelines.